Hello and welcome to Libre.io, a library for interfacing with Linux I.O. devices. Uh, my name is Dan Nikita. I'm a software development engineer uh, at Analog Devices. Uh, one of my responsibilities is to maintain the uh, Libre.io code. There are five topics I would like to talk about today. I would like to talk about what Libio is and then look at its structure, then go through the API of Libio and then see what uh, bindings Libio has to offer. And in the end, I would also like to talk about some practices that we are hoping uh, to make the Libio more robust, more stable, and uh, be as much as possible uh, without um, bugs. Libio is an open source user space library. Uh, it's been around for more than six years and the, it's consistently being improved. Uh, so it has, it has been written in a C language. Um, and it and it uh, cross platform works on Linux, Windows, and uh, Mac OS. And uh, the code is released under the LGPL uh, license version 2.1 and any uh, above that version. Libio has been created with one purpose in mind, and that was to make things easier and faster when it comes to developing applications that need to interact with the Linux industrial input-output devices. On an embedded system running Linux, there will be a Linux kernel that uh, can interact with uh, hardware through I.O. Uh, drivers and will expose an API for those uh, devices uh, in user space. And this is where uh, Libio comes in. Uh, it will in interact with the exposed uh, API and uh, will provide a more easier and flexible way to interact with the I.O. devices and provide this uh, flexibility to um, any client application. Before going further, I would like to say a few words about the Linux Industrial Input Output or I.O. It is a part of the Linux kernel and it is a subsystem that provides support for devices such as analog to dig digital converters, accelerometers, capacitance to digital converters, digital to analog converters, gyroscopes, IMUs, color and light sensors, magnetometers, pressure sensors, proximity sensors, and temperature sensors. More about this can be found on kernel.org and also on wiki.analog.com uh, where uh, there are a few other things about I.O. The API of I.O. subsystem is exposed through SysFS at, at the following location. Uh, so all I.O. devices can be found at uh, this uh, path. Let's see an example. Uh, for instance, um, let's say we have a one uh, device. So that can be found in, uh, at the path sysbus IO devices. And then there will be a directory called IO um, device zero. Um, and here we can see uh, that there will be a file called uh, name. And then um, what, we, what we typically see here is um, a channel of that device and in this particular case, the name of the channel is voltage zero. Uh, then uh, there's the, the out uh, prefix. This uh, signals that uh, the channel it has a direction and the direction is uh, of type output. It could also be uh, as an input. Uh, then uh, we can see a V1, which is a name for the voltage zero. So voltage zero would uh, means the uh, represents the ID of the uh, channel, while while V1 represents the name or 
alias if you want uh, of the channel and then uh, the last last thing is raw which is a property or an attribute or a parameter of the voltage zero channel um, as you can see oh, on line three uh, there's a similar name but the suffix uh, is changed and we can see scale instead of raw uh, this is another attribute of the voltage zero channel mm, so um, as you can see a voltage uh, zero has a has many attributes and um, starting from line six we can identify then that there is another channel uh, with the id voltage one and the name v2 which has uh, the same uh, attributes or parameters that the previous channel has also it has the same uh, direction and then on, on line 10 we can see that um, we have something that it's a little bit different than the channels we still have a prefix uh, out and then we have voltage but we have no number for this and then we have uh, power down mode available so th this means that uh, the power down mode available is an attribute of all out voltages so this attribute uh, applies to both voltage zero and voltage one uh, also um, you can see the power down mode available uh, is looks slightly uh, resembles with power down um, mode so what the suffix available means is that these attributes will um, show so that its value had its value uh, contains a list of uh, possible values that can be used to set the power down attribute um, so uh, going forward to line 11 we can see another attribute which is called sampling rate uh, it has no voltage or out prefix this means that it's an attribute of the io device while power down for instance was an attribute of uh, voltage one channel uh, name is again uh, the same uh, as the sampling rate an attribute of io device zero um, then we can see that uh, inside the io device zero directory there's a directly called scan element uh, where we have uh, this time we have uh, again two volt two channels with IDs voltage zero and voltage one. Uh, this time the direction of the channel is input, which means that uh, through this channel we can read the data from the hardware, uh, as opposed to the out channel. Uh, which can be used to provide uh, or stream data to the hardware or just send data to the hardware so going back to the scan elements directory um, we can see that um, there are um, three, ta three attributes for each um, uh, channel and uh, typically uh, N E N um, start uh, comes from enable, so you can enable or disable a channel. Uh, in this case, uh, then there is an index which provides the, uh, as it the name says, the index of the channel, and then there is the type which uh, could tell you more information about what uh, type of data it. Uh, the voltage the channel can uh, uh, acquire so it typically it will tell you that uh, it can get samples that can be 8 bit long um, and then it can tell you about NDNs could be a big NDN or uh, little NDN 
Uh, also, if there's some shifting in samples, so if samples are shifted to the right or to the left with a specific number of bits, uh, that uh, will also be represented in, uh, will be set in type and reading the type, you will get this kind of information. So what, what is different between the uh, between the voltage zero in inside the scan elements and the um, voltage zero that it's outside the directory is that uh, the uh, channels inside the scan elements can um, work with the buffer and they can capture data uh, continuously and uh, the, their samples, the capture samples will get stored in a buffer. So all, all this logic that I just uh, described is a logic that uh, a client application needs to uh, have inside it if the, that application wants to interact with the, uh, directly with the IAO um, API. And what, what libio does is that uh, it will contain this logic and will do all this parsing of all these names and prefixes and uh, directories and it will know how to um, place each of them in categories and classify uh, the device and the channels and which attributes go to which channel and which attributes go to device. Um, and th this this is one of the core functionalities of uh, of Libio. And once once you uh, so once Libio has been uh, developed and uh, stored this logic inside it, uh, any any client uh, that uses Libio will have direct access access to this, and uh, it won't have to bother. Uh, thinking about parsing everything and uh, doing the same thing uh, because Libio can do that for, for you. So uh, as I've mentioned before, Libio will do the following steps. It will identify the I devices that can be used. Uh, then uh, it will identify the channels that belong to each device and their direction and if they're devices that uh, the, if they are channels that work with the buffer or uh, they are or, or if they are not then it will uh, assign the specific attributes uh, for the ones for the channels and the one for the devices and then it will create a context which is um, like a place where all devices will will exist and where so it's a place where you can browse through the devices and through the channels and through all the all the attributes. Well, another important question is where uh, Libio can run, where it will run. Uh, so there are two types of platforms uh, where uh, it can run. One is an embedded system that runs Linux and includes IO drivers for devices that are physically connected to the system, such as ADC DEX and everything that I uh, mentioned in uh, when I was talking about the IO uh, subsystem. Um, also, it can run on an embedded system with a non-Linux framework. Um, so uh, when, when Libio runs on an embedded system, we, we call it that Libio runs on, on the target. And then there's the other place where uh, Libio can run, and that is on a regular PC or laptop that runs some Linux di distribution, Windows, Mac OS, OpenBSD, or at BSD, which uh, is connected to the embedded system in a way. It can be through a network link, USB link, or cellular, cell serial connection. Now let's have a look at uh, how the library is structured. The library is composed by one high-level API, which is the same across all platforms, and several backends. The first is the local backend, which interfaces the Linux through SysFS virtual system. This is the backend that we'll use when Libio runs locally on a uh, target. 
Then there's the network backend, which interfaces the IOD server through a network link. So IOD uh, is part of Libio, and uh, it is a piece of software that acts as a server and uh, interacts with a uh, network client um, that usually run on a PC. And then uh, the third uh, backend is the USB backend, which interfaces uh, the IOD server, just uh, the same as the network backend, through a USB link. Uh, there's the XML uh, backend, which uh, interfaces a uh, XML file. And the last one is the serial backend, which interfaces tiny IOD uh, through a serial link. Uh, as I mentioned before, serial um, uh, backend is, can be used with tiny IOD, which will run on an embedded uh, system with a non-Linux uh, framework. The software stack below shows us a client-server connection. On the right, there is a client application that, for example, runs on Windows, uses Libio, and calls uh, the API, and through the network backend, sends commands to the IOD server, uh, which, uh, in turn, uh, uh, recognizes the commands and uses uh, Libio, and through the high-level API and local backend, it, it interacts with the IOD with the IO devices. Uh, the job of IOD server is to stay uh, always open of, and listen to potential new uh, connections with uh, other clients, and uh, it basically shares the local or exposes the local backend to through the network to to clients. The C language uh, API. There are four types that together uh, make almost all of the API: uh, the context, the device, the channel, and the buffer. The context represents an instance of the library. A context can have zero or many devices while a device can have zero or many channels, but can have only uh, zero or one buffer. Each of the four base types can have an attribute, which is uh, defined by a, a name, which is a C string, and each attribute can have uh, a value or multiple values. Uh, besides this, uh, the device can have Debug attributes, which are used for debug purposes. The API has many functions. Uh, first set of functions have uh, to do with scanning for IO context. So first thing to do is look for uh, available context before creating a context. Let's see an example of how we can scan for context. First thing to do is call IO create scan context which will return a scan context object. Then we will pass the scan context object uh, to the function io scan context get info list, and also we'll pass by reference the info object. Uh, what libio will do is allocate memory for the info object and fill uh, the list with uh, a number of uh, context information, and then it will, it will uh, terminate the list with a null object. If you want to get information about uh, on the description about the context, we can do that with IO context info get a description. And if we want to get the URI of the context, we can do this with IO context info get URI. Once we are done with the info object and the scan context object, we can use the, these functions to free the memory that Alibio allocated for us. The next set of function has to do with creating context. We can create a default context which will uh, create a local uh, context, or if it cannot, it will look for the IOD remote environment variable. And if that has an IP set, it will create a network context. We can specifically ask to create a local context or an XML context, which gets created from a file. Or if we want, we can uh, create the context from memory. Then we, can, we have the option to create a network context from uh, using uh, an IP version 4 or version 6. Both are supported. 
the most generic function to create a context is I have create context from your right. Um, and then the last function is to clone uh, the context. Once we are done using the context, we can use uh, when we when we should use IO context destroy to uh, free all uh, resources. Let's see some examples of how we can create different types of context. To create a, a local context, we can use this function, which will only work on target and will not work on remotes. To create a network context, we can use this function. And all we need to do is provide the IP uh, of the target. To create a USB context, we can use this function and we need to provide the device port and instance for that USB uh, device. To create a serial connection, use the same function as for the USB context, and that is I will create context from URI, and then uh, in this case, we need to uh, add the serial prefix, and then we need to specify the serial port, baud rate, and uh, other configuration. Once we have the context created, we can navigate through it and look for available devices and their channels. To do that, we have a couple of functions for the device that uh, can give us the number of devices available in a context, or we can get a device by index, or we can find the device by name. Similar functions are available for the channel object. This is an example of how to go through all the devices and through all the channels of each device. First, um, we create a context, then we use that context to find the total number of devices available in that context. And then we use IO context get a device and we pass the local context and we pass an index for the device that we want to get a reference of. Once once we get to that, we can find the number of channels for that device. Um, and next, we can obtain the reference to the channel for that device using IO device get channel, and we pass the device reference and then an index for that channel. The context, the device, the channel, and the buffer can have attributes or parameters, which can be identified by name. They uh, can represent a value or an action. For instance, for an ADC, uh, which can have an attribute called uh, power mode, uh, with, which can have a, uh, can take values like power on, uh, sleep, and power off, uh, setting one of these uh, values would represent an action. To get the number of attributes for each type, you can use I context get attributes count. And uh, to enumerate all the attributes, you can use I context get attribute at the specified index. There are sets of functions that can be used to read from an attribute or write to it. While you can use I device attribute read to store the content of, uh, of an attribute in a C string. You can also use read bool, read long long, or read double for those attributes that you know that their value can only be integers or double. There is also the IO device attribute read all function allowing you to read all the attributes of a particular device. Same functions apply for writing and also uh, the similar function exists for channel specific attributes. The process of capturing samples from a device or sending the sa samples to the device can be done only using the IO buffer object and its functions. The first things, thing that you need to do is enable the channels. You can do that with IO channel enable and disable, and also you can check the, check the status of the channel with IO channel is enabled. The enable and the disable will actually happen when the IO buffer gets created. Not all channels can be enabled, only those of type scan element. Uh, a scan element channel is a channel that is capable of streaming data into or from above. Then the next step after you have enabled the channels you want to capture samples from is to create a buffer. You can do that with IO create buffer. Once you're, you're done with the buffer, you can use IO buffer destroy to um, deallocate memory for it. Then, after you have the buffer created, 
in order to update the buffer with new samples, you need to call IO buffer refill. While the previous slide was about getting samples from an input device, here we can uh, see how to push uh, samples to an output uh, device. This is done with a different function called IO buffer push. So if, if the IO buffer object has been created with the cyclic parameter set to true, and the kernel driver supports cyclic buffers, the submitted buffer will be repeated over and over again until the buffer is destroyed. We can also push uh, just a, a part of the entire buffer size of samples to the device. This is done with IO buffer push partial. Now that we have seen how to update a buffer with new samples, let's see how we can access those samples. Uh, the first method is called the callback method, and uh, Libio provides a way to iterate over the buffer by registering the callback function with the IO buffer for each sample function. The callback function will be called for each sample set of the buffer, which will contain a valid sample if the buffer has been refilled or correspond to an area where a sample should be stored if using an output device. So this is how the callback should look like. Uh, this is the required signature. Um, in order to call th this callback for each uh, sample, you need to register it with IO buffer for each sample. The second method to access samples from the buffer is with the for loop method. So this method allows you to iterate over the sample slots that correspond to one channel. As such, it is interesting if you want to process the data channel by channel. It basically consists in a for loop that uses the functions I buffer first, I buffer step, and I buffer end. So with this free function, you can uh, loop through the entire buffer. Libio can also be accessed from uh, other uh, programming language, and this can be done with the help of bindings. So let's see what bindings Libio has to offer. First of all, since Libio has been uh, written in C, it can be used directly in C++. Then there is the Python binding and the C# -sharp binding. These bindings um, are available in the same repository as uh, Libio. Besides these, there's the Rust and the Node.js um, bindings, which are um, created by somebody else, uh, not analog devices, and they are maintained on GitHub separately. And then there's the GNU Radio uh, binding or the GNU Radio blocks, which allow Libio to integrate with uh, GNU Radio. This exists in a separate repository, but uh, in the analog devices domain. The Python bindings consist of a py file. Location can be found at the uh, uh, below URL. The C types module has been used to write the bindings, and since version to uh, 0 0.21, the Python bindings have been available through PyPy and therefore can be installed with pip. Also, there is a documentation for the Python bindings. The c -sharp bindings uh, cover the full panel of features that Alibio provides. Uh, the c -sharp bindings are spread across multiple files. And there's the scan context, the context, the device channel, IO buffer attributes, uh, triggers, and IO lib. So each of these files provides a couple of methods that directly call their C counterparts. Having uh, C-sharp bindings allows um, users to develop uh, client applications on Windows using .NET. Uh, also, there is a documentation for the C-sharp bindings at this URL. To integrate Libio with GNU Radio, a couple of uh, GNU Radio blocks had to be written IO Device Source and IO Device Sync. These blocks allow samples to be streamed from the hardware into the GNU Radio context and 
uh, from the GNU radio context to stream data to the hardware. These plugs are available through the GNU radio I.O. module. For the I.O. device source, there are a couple of uh, configuration fields that user can uh, set. First of all, you can set the type of context that you want to create. Then you can choose which channels to enable. Uh, after that, you can choose the buffer size. So even if it's a streaming process, uh, internally uh, an I.O. buffer will be created. So this is where you choose the size for that buffer. Then there's the decimation. And also there's the parameters where you can uh, ch change um, specific attributes of the device. The I.O. device sync provides configuration fields for choosing the context type, enable, enabling the desired channel, setting the buffer size, uh, there is the interpolation option, uh, you can uh, set the uh, cyclic flag if you want to repeat over and over the same um, set of samples. And also you can uh, change some of the device attributes. Um, for example, you can change the sample rate of the device like uh, in the example below. The last topic is about practices that aim for a robust library. One practice that um, makes sure um, that code that goes into master or the development development branch is first checked uh, is to use a pull request system where each pull request is subject to review so no pull request can be merged with at least one approval from a reviewer um, push, also pushing commits directly to master is disabled second practice is about uh, enabling as many warnings as possible um, this way, uh, the compiler will tell us if uh, there could be potential problems, potential issues or bugs. Um, a next step on this would be to enable, uh, to treat all warnings as errors. Um, this kind of enforces developers to not uh, let not overlook the warnings and just uh, have them pile up. Um, but currently for LibIO, uh, treating warnings as errors uh, has been enabled only during the continuous integration. So for somebody that wants to build locally, it will only get a warning. But once you want to create a pull request, uh, the CI will build uh, LibIO before uh, the pull request gets merged and uh, those warnings will be treated as error and the build will fail. And whoever created the pull request will have to uh, fix those warnings before um, getting a, an approval since the build uh, will fail. The third practice is to use continuous integration whenever a pull request is uh, submitted. For LibIO, it also works for uh, regular branches. So every time a new commit gets added to any branch, the continuous integration will uh, work on that. So uh, as you can see, LibIO has four checks uh, for each um, pull request. First is uh, it's using Codacy. Um, which statically analyzes the code and checks for code defects. The second check is done by AppVail, which tests if builds uh, on Windows work. Uh, the third and fourth uh, checks are made by Travis, uh, which checks if um, builds on different uh, distribution of Linux and on Mac OS work. 
to be more specific, Travis checks uh, macOS builds, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Jesse and Stretch versions, and also uh, CentOS versions 6, 7 and 8. The fourth practice is to make use of static analyzer to look for code issues. One tool is Coverity. Um, the check is done as part of one of Travis jobs. Uh, the second tool is Codesy, which is integrated with GitHub and we have seen it uh, on the previous slide. The LibIO ABI tries to be both backwards and forwards compatible. This means applications compiled against an older version will work fine with a newer dynamically linked library. Applications compiled against a newer version will work fine with an older dynamically linked library as long as they don't access any new features. Uh, LibIO uses CMake to facilitate the building of uh, LibIO. To use the library, uh, you, you only need to include one header, which is io.h, uh, and one uh, shared library to link against. The Doxygen uh, is used to generate the API for, this document, for the API documentation. Um, the latest release is uh, version 0.21 and so far 26 releases have been made. LibIO has dependencies. Um, this can be uh, classified by which part of LibIO is using them. So there are the core dependencies, uh, libxml2, bison and flex. Then there are the backend dependencies. For local, it needs libiio. Uh, for the USB, it uses libusb. For network, it needs libavahi. For serial backend, it needs libserial port. Also for generating documentation, the doxygen and graph widths uh, are required. So uh, not all backends um, um, need to be uh, compiled during a build, so you can uh, opt out a couple of uh, them. You can build without USB, without network, and without a serial backend. Also, you can be built with or without documentation. If you want to read more about LibIO or contribute to the source code uh, or report any bugs uh, and open issues with uh, uh, feature requests or enhancements, um, you can go to github.com uh, uh, analog devices in and libio. Uh, there's also a welcome page um, where you can find documentation about uh, libio, about the bindings, and uh, all sorts of uh, other things. Um, then you you, uh, you can go directly to the API documentation. And the last two are um, pages on wiki.analog.com, which also talk about LibIO. The first one talks a little bit about how to get the and install the dependencies and how to uh, get uh, the binaries for LibIO, while uh, the, the last one uh, talks about the uh, internals of LibIO, about uh, the mechanisms um, to a very uh, low uh, detail level. Thank you for following this presentation.